Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar in our TTRA webinar series. Today's session is on implementation science in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research. My name is Dr. Andion Parlade, and I'm the Associate Project Manager for the TTRA program, and I'll be your facilitator for today's session. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many lands we are meeting on today. I live and work on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people here in Melbourne, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and future. I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today for this webinar. Next slide, please. In today's session, we'll hear two presentations from our invited speakers, and then open up the floor for questions from the audience. To submit questions, please use the Q&A box and not the chat box found at the bottom of your screen in your Zoom toolbar. If you have the same question as someone else, you can use the upvote feature, which will raise the question to the top of the list. Questions can be submitted anonymously, but if there's any need for follow-up, we won't be able to reach you. For any other questions you may have about the TTRA or the funding round, the TTRA team can be contacted via our email address, which is displayed at the top right hand corner of this slide. For those who wish to watch this webinar at a later date, or if you have any colleagues who couldn't attend, a recording will be made available as an on-demand video, as well as an, a podcast episode on our website. We'll notify all registrants when it's published, as well as announce it on all our social media chan channels. Next slide, please. We have a stellar pair of presenters today to talk to us about implementation science in the context of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research. Our first speaker is Profes Professor Gillian Harvey. Jill is the strength lead for implementation at the Australian Centre for Health Services Innovation, or OSHI, which is one of the TTRA's partner organizations. Jill has a clinical background in nursing and is a Matthew Flinders Fellow, as well as a professor of health services and implementation research in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences at Flinders University. She's a deputy director of knowledge translation in the college's Caring Futures Institute and is a co-director of the Aged Care Partnering Program in the Center for Aged Care Research and Industry Innovation Australia, or ARIA. Jill is also an adjunct professor of implementation science at Queensland University of Technology and an affiliated researcher at Dalarna University in Sweden. We'll also hear from Professor Ray Mani. Ray is a Bidjara man with family ties to Central West Queensland who has led cardiovascular disease research, particularly, particularly for Indigenous people. He is a professor of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health, discipline lead of population health at Flinders University, and a visiting scientist at the Australian eHealth Research Centre at CSIRO. He has developed and implemented a range of research projects with key strategic partnerships with Indigenous community-controlled organizations and hospitals. This includes establishing a multi-agency research partnership, an e-health research collaboration focused on establishing a best practice framework to guide and inform culturally safe e-health interventions with Indigenous people. Ray has also led the co-design of mixed methods evaluations with Indigenous community controlled organizations. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to give a very brief overview of MTP Connect and the TTRA program. If you've been following our webinar series, you would have heard all of this before, so I'll keep it short, but please feel free to go back to our other webinars or visit the MTP Connect website for more information. MTP Connect is Australia's growth center for the medical technology, biotechnology, and pharmaceutical sectors. As an independent, not-for-profit profit organization, we work with stakeholders all across the MTP value chain in meaningful ways to advocate as a trusted advisor, to promote greater collaboration nationally as well as internationally, and to drive innovation and productivity. MTP Connect also delivers funding for strategic initiatives. We're currently deploying more than $182 million in funding on behalf of the Department of Industry, Science and Resources and the Department of Health with its MRFF initiative. And the TTRA program is one of these initiatives. Next slide, please. The Targeted Translation Research Accelerator, or TTRA, is a $47 million integrated research program specifically designed to improve the prevention, 
Management and Treatment of Diabetes and Cardiovascular Disease and Associated Complications in Australia. TTRA funding is drawn from the Public and Preventative Health Research Initiative of the MRFF. So there is a balance of public health and health equity approaches, as well as commercial objectives. The TTRA is deployed across two key pillars. The first was the establishment of two national research centers, namely the Australian Center for Accelerating Diabetes Innovations, or ACADI, and the Australian Stroke and Heart Research Accelerator, or ASHRA. In addition to the delivery of a research portfolio and training programs, these two centers are focused on finding solutions to reduce health inequities, as well as support health workforce development for indigenous communities. The TTRA also provides contestable funding opportunities to support individual research projects that address priority areas in diabetes and cardiovascular disease, identified through an evidence-based national coordinated health sector needs assessment. To date, $11.9 million has been awarded to 16 research projects through two rounds, attracting an additional $17.7 million in contributions from academia and industry. The TTRA's third and final round of research projects funding focuses on supporting diabetes and cardiovascular disease projects that address unmet health and medical needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. To support and incentivize translation as a natural course of activity for those applying for and receiving funding, MTP Connect has also partnered with leading organizations to provide mentoring and commercialization and implementation advice. For our third round of funding, we are proud to partner with the Luwicha Institute to ensure that the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities were centered in every aspect of the round. Next slide, please. Applications for round three are now open and will close on the 28th of April at 4 p.m. AEST. If you wish to apply, please submit a notice of intent to gain access to the application form on the Smarty Grants platform. We cannot accept late submissions, so please be mindful of the time zones and time differences around Australia. And please don't leave submitting your application until the last minute. You can scan the QR code on screen for all the necessary information. And my colleague, Mana, will also drop a link in the chat box for your easy access. Next slide, please. Lastly, to coincide with round three, we are hosting this webinar series to highlight key elements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research. The first two webinars on the principles of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research and engaging meaningfully with community and ethics and reciprocity in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research are now available as on-demand videos and podcasts on our website. We also have plans of holding more webinars in the future, so please watch this space. Next slide, please. All right, so let's take a minute to get to know the audience. Um, there's about 60, 57 people tuning in right now, which is a great turnout. So we'll run a quick poll. Could we please have our poll up? So first we'll ask what your profession is. Uh, are you an academic researcher, a health professional, a health service administrator, et cetera? If you mark your profession as other, please feel free to pop up what your, pop what your profession is into the chat box. And the second question is, are you involved or have you ever been involved in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research related to diabetes and cardiovascular disease? Okay, I'll give you a few more seconds to respond. All right, um, could we see our results, please? All right, we have very interesting results. So most of the people joining us today are academic researchers with 57% of the votes and 27% um, answered others. Um, and we have a few health professionals and health administrators in the audience today. Uh, for the second question, 
35% answer that yes, they are involved in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research in cardiovascular disease and diabetes. 25% answered that yes, they're involved in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research, but not related to diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And 39% answered that they have not been involved in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research. That's uh, very interesting. That gives us a little bit of insight on who's joining us today. Thanks for that. And without much further ado, I'll hand over to our first presenter, Professor Jill Harvey, to talk to us about the principles of implementation science. Jill, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, and yeah, the slides are just coming up. So yeah, thank you and um, morning to everybody. Um, I, in the, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to give just a general overview and introduction to implementation science, and then Ray will context, contextualize that to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research. So next slide, please. So like Didi, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land. I was actually intending to be speaking to you from Brisbane this morning, but due to flight complications and delays, I'm actually still at Adelaide Airport. So I pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land here, the Ghana people, but also to the traditional owners in on in all the lands that the participants today are joining us from. Next slide, please. So I thought I'd really just focus on a number of high level issues in terms of discussing implementation science. So firstly, what do we mean by it? Secondly, why I think we need it. And then I'll really spend most of the time just uh, illustrating some of the key ideas and concepts within implementation science. Next slide, please. So implementation science as a term has probably only been around for the last 16 or 17 years, but it, it didn't come out of nowhere. It, it really grew on the growing recognition um, from the late 1990s onwards, really, that there was this gap between research evidence and what actually happened in policy and practice. And, and in 2006, I guess the, the term implementation science became one that uh, was introduced, particularly with the launch of a journal by the same name, and, and was described as a study of the methods by which we try to get evidence into routine practice, but very much built on existing work around clinical audit, quality improvement, evidence-based practice, et cetera. Next slide, please. And, and to, to illustrate it very simply, um, you know, there'd been a lot of work around developing clinical guidelines all under the umbrella of evidence-based practice, the Cochrane collaboration, development of systematic reviews, and, and that really gave us the know what, the evidence. But uh, if we could click on to the, the next box, please. Implementation science is really about the know-how. How do we take this evidence and actually as effectively and efficiently as possible ensure that it gets taken up into policy and practice in healthcare? Next slide, please. Why that matters, I think, is um, there is this persistent gap between what research evidence suggests we should be doing uh, for example, in the form of evidence-based guideline recommendations and what actually happens in the delivery of healthcare. And from um, an original study in the US in 1998, right up until the present day, studies consistently seem to suggest that what gets delivered um, around 60 to 70% of the time is appropriate care which suggests that 30 to 40% of the time, uh, it's not best evidence-based care. And those studies have been undertaken in the US, in Europe, the care track studies in Australia, and last year, a study published in Canada, 
all come in with um, similar findings. So that really highlights that we need to get much better at connecting what we know should happen and what we actually do in practice. So that know what, know how connection. Next slide, please. So, so you know, in a whirlwind, a whirlwind overview of implementation science, some key messages I think are firstly that implementation is not a linear or a rational process. Secondly, that context really matters. And thirdly, that implementation involves not just technical processes, it's essentially a social and relational process. And I'll, I'll briefly cover off on all three of those as we go through. So next slide, please. So I think we often uh, hear about the translational pipeline in, in discussions, in policy, in um, literature, but clicking onto the, the next slide, please. You know, to me, um, I think that misrepresents what it's like in practice. It's not, it does not happen as a pipeline. It's a much more complex, contested, messy and challenging process to actually change what people do uh, in clinical practice or in terms of making decisions about healthcare and healthcare policy. So next slide, please. So although, although there are um, probably a whole multitude of varieties of this type of representation of the translational pipeline, where we move from basic science to testing the effectiveness of interventions. And then um, there's another stage where we see that, that those interventions should be applied and implemented. I think the reality, the ne next slide please, is that it is much more complex than that and is better represented by ideas around complexity and com com complex adaptive systems. And, and really what that means is that, you know, the process of moving from best evidence to using it in clinical practice is, um, is, is not a straight line. So yeah, what I was uh, just saying, if it's if it's a complex process, how can implementation science help? And I think um, you know three messages are um, firstly that there's really a, a wealth of literature around theories and frameworks that can help us inform implementation. Secondly, um, that we've now got good evidence around strategies that are more or less effective to support implementation, and that can inform the processes that we use to achieve desired implementation outcomes. So next slide, please. So um, theories and frameworks, I have to say there are lots and lots of them, and we would probably be here all day if I tried to talk through all of them. So if we can just flick through, um, I'll just show you some of the ones. And you'll see that there are an awful lot of acronyms that describe all of these frameworks. That's it. Thank you. Um, can you just go back to the previous slide? Um, you know, just to give you an example, and there may be many people online who've used or come across some of these, but one, the theoretical domains framework, the knowledge to action cycle, the consolidated framework for implementation research. Really the main message I'd say, and we'll move to the next slide, is that these frameworks provide a scaffolding. They help us to, to understand the factors that we need to think about when we're planning or undertaking or evaluating an implementation project. And there are definitely differences philosophically and practically between the different theories and frameworks, but most of them focus on these four key areas that can influence whether and how well an implementation happens. So there are characteristics of the intervention itself. There are factors relating to um, 
who you want to implement it or who needs to be on board and support it. There are context factors around where you're intending to implement. And there are multiple levels of context from a very local setting right through to the health system level. And, and all of those are factors that need to be taken into account when considering how to approach implementation. So if we move to the next slide, please. If you think about them as a series of, of almost concentric circles, at the middle, we've got the thing that we want to implement, but that is influenced by who we're going to be working with and where the setting is that we're going to do that. So at each of those levels, we should be thinking about the barriers and the enablers to implementation. So do people agree with the intervention? Do they have the knowledge, the skills, the time, the resources to apply it? And what are the contextual factors in terms of culture, leadership, constraints that are going to influence that? And that should determine the how. How do we go about it? And that's really where we, we can then think about what strategies to use. So if we look at the next slide, please. Um, again, there's a long list of strategies that can be used um, to support implementation, many of which are part of everyday activity in healthcare. Um, and um, many of them have been um, reviewed as part of, of, of systematic reviews and other research. So um, next, next two slides, please. And um, the Cochrane um, collaboration, they have a group called EPOC or Effective Practice and Organization of Care that have produced reviews on many of the interventions listed here. And this relatively new publication, Implementation Science, has got a good summary of the evidence that underpins um, these different strategies. So the question is then, if we've got theories and frameworks, we've got a list of different strategies, how do we know what to put together for a specific implementation project or initiative? Um, next slide, please. And, and I guess a simple analogy of that is to think about if you have a cookbook, that's almost like your theory or your framework. It says, think about these factors um, in terms of implementation. Next, next one, please. Then we've got the strategies. We've got a list of ingredients um, that we can choose from, whether that's audit and feedback or using reminders and prompts or uh, delivering some form of educational intervention. The, the real challenge is how do we put the theory, the strategies together, next one please, in a way that we get this rather than next one please. So that to me is the art of implementation. Next slide please. And it's really thinking about um, you know, in terms of, of making decisions, it's assessing the context where we're trying to do this piece of work, really thinking at that local level uh, or at the organisational level, what are the specific barriers and enablers that we need to take um, into account and designing an, an appropriate implementation approach. So sadly, there is no one size fits all to implementation. It is about understanding the people, the place and the intervention and, and designing approaches accordingly. Next slide, please. And I think that is the challenge that we've got to keep working on in terms of implementation and implementation science. How do we tailor the right approaches to the project, the people and the context? I think there's growing interest in implementation around how do we ensure equity in that and that we really think about that as an underlying principle. Uh, how do we understand the, the economics? So, you know, when would a simple intervention do and when do we re really need a much more complex one? And, and increasingly, I think, ensuring that what we do under the umbrella of implementation science really does support and connect to day-to-day -day implementation practice that we don't... Um, 
almost create the same divide between implementation science and practice, but that we do it in a very grounded and pragmatic way. So that, that's a very short introduction to the, the sort of thinking and the principles of implementation science. Uh, apologies that I dropped out halfway through, but I'm very happy to pick up any um, questions or uh, comments at the end of the seminar. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, that's, that's really the contact details for OSHI. And um, I'll stop now so that Ray has time to present. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. As she mentioned, Jill will have a, quest a chance to answer questions from the audience. Now I'll hand over to Professor Ray Mani to talk about his experience of implementation in his research. Thanks for joining us, Ray. Thanks. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, um, good afternoon um, or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Ray Marnie and I'm following on and going to provide some examples of implementation science. Uh, first of all, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we're on today. I'm talking to you as well from the lands of the Kaurna people here in Adelaide. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and um, pass on my uh, uh, respect to the traditional owners and the ongoing custodians of the land here and pay my respects to our elders past, present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Also, I'd like to acknowledge that we as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are our first researchers, our first scientists, our first educators and our first healers of illness. And I pass these respects on to um, all sites that are joining us today. First of all, a little brief background about myself. I'm with Flinders University, Professor of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health and Discipline Lead of Population Health within the College of Medicine and Public Health. And I'm also a visiting scientist with the Australian eHealth Research Centre. Uh, it uh, has a number of sites across Australia, predominantly based in Brisbane. My people are Butcher people from Central West Queensland, and I'm, you know, really lucky and privileged to have still have strong connections into Western Queensland, uh, with the lands where my mum and my family grew up and still live. And some of the projects, one of the projects in particular, I'm going to talk about today, I'm lucky enough to spend time out there. So just some context um, before I get into the examples. Uh, this, this work that I'm going to talk about today, this research, um, have uh, primarily been funded by uh, CSIRO in the Australian eHealth Research Centre with contributions from the Heart Foundation and Gundia Health Service. Um, now this picture here shows a, a footprint of some of the work that uh, the Indigenous Health Team has led and since its inception in 2019. And the footprint, footprint, as you can see, tends to focus on Queensland, and that's because of um, COVID. Um, for a couple of years there, we were kind of trapped in Queensland, so it gave us a chance to strengthen our relationships with services uh, across rural and remote Queensland. There's a photo there of uh, the main team members there, and I'll talk some more about the, the team as we go through the um, presentation. Like I say, I've got 15 minutes, and I want to focus in on two projects. Um, so I can't get into some of the other very exciting work that's being led by the centre. As I say, I'm going to focus on two uh, projects. One is around uh, mobile health and hypertension, and one is to do with the St George Wellbeing Centre. Um, the two projects are, are very different and uh, at different sort of stages of development. Uh, the first one is a situation where we as researchers and scientists um, propose the intervention to community. If you like, we uh, went to community with the research question, and that's around the CSIRO platform that had been, is currently and, and uh, built on a foundation of being used in cardiac rehab and in uh, gestational diabetes management in mainstream urban public hospital settings. And the question was, can these, this intervention be used in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled health settings and complement their existing models of care. So that was kind of the research question we had. And that's the one I'll uh, talk about um, in a minute. 
And the other one is around a wellbeing centre, really exciting, innovative wellbeing centre that's under development in St George in Western Queensland. And it's where the community has come to us as uh, Flinders and CSIRO to utilise our expertise as researchers and scientists to establish an evidence base for their intervention um, that's ultimately targeting um, closing the gap targets and how can research and evaluation contribute to con continuous quality improvement in their, in their service delivery um, and interventions. So they've got the question. But overall, I want to sort of demonstrate uh, as a team how we have a strong focus on co-design and research translation and with a, a emphasis on respectful research partnership building, or as we term it, relationships before partnerships. And, you know, uh, as uh, was explained, um, you know, implementation is complex, um, you know, varies for every project, and then you throw in something like COVID. So M Health Hypertension, it's the first project I want to talk about. Now, just some background, what it is, it's a platform developed by CSIRO that involves a uh, patient using uh, an app to enter measurements, in this case, uh, blood pressure, to uh, which you, know, you need to monitor your blood pressure if you're um, hypertensive uh, regularly and take regular medication. And so the app enables uh, uh, patients to, uh, um, if they've got a Bluetooth enabled speedometer or can enter the, the readings, record them on their phone. That data is stored in, a, in the cloud and it can be accessed in real time by clinicians at their health service. So that's the fundamentals of the um, platform. And as I said, it's been used in, um, to manage a number of conditions. So um, we're at the stage where we've undertaken a feasibility trial with two Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled health services, Mullingar and Wachopran. Um, one's based in Cairns and one's based in Mariba. And we've um, been uh, working through that, and I'll unpack that a little bit in a second. So how did it start? So as I said, we, if you like, had the question. And um, in partnership with the Queensland Aboriginal and Islander Health Council, they're the peak body representing the 25 or so uh, at shows in Queensland, and they're an affiliate member of Nacho. Uh, we I went to them and talked to them about the uh, strength and the usefulness um, and the evidence that, we'd already been, that had already been gathered, gathered around the M Health platform to see if there was an interest in either um, in, you know, CVD research and uh, technology or, or this platform itself. So uh, in partnership with Quake, a number of services uh, were approached, ones that were sort of willing, potentially willing to participate and that sent us on a, a journey of meeting with a number of services across the state and um, demonstrating and discussing with them the strengths of e-health or mobile health and uh, how this could be a, a model of, this, this platform could support their model of care. Um, so key, some key things, I won't unpack all the, the key findings, but just to sort of highlight that what we found, uh, much of it resonated with what we had seen in the literature, but it also expanded on and provided us with great depth of how to approach uh, mHealth with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled. And look, some of the outcomes, uh, importantly, uh, research translation. Um, we fed, fed back to the services that participated with us. We actually returned on site to share the findings. We also presented at uh, the annual uh, Quake members meeting in 2020 and through that facilitating that um, you know research research translating and, and sharing back our findings from the initial scoping um, a couple of services identified that they would be willing to participate in the feasibility trial and along um, to support that uh, we recruited Andrew Goodman as a PhD candidate and uh, Andrew's been sort of driving that um, um, ongoing um, uh, work around service provider information around their views um, and interest and patients around um, use of M Health, and he's currently analysing the service provider interactions with the web-based portal and the patient app use uh, usage data from participants. So soon, hopefully, um, we'll have some outcomes around that, 
and Andrew is um, to remind him he's on the line. I'm sure that he'll be submitting his PhD uh, in the next uh, few weeks. Um, and in the next phase, we'll look at how to conduct a more comprehensive trial. So that's a real snapshot of that one project. But like I say, um, I'm just gonna talk about two, and this is a, a different project that we're uh, undertaking in partnership with um, Gundia Health Service based in St. George. Well, Gundia Health Service is an Aboriginal health, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Community Controlled Health Service based in Dolby that has a number of um, clinics and sites across Western Queensland. One of those sites is St. George, but also to um, Oki and Chinchilla. And what, uh, say, what Gundia have been doing, uh, very innovative um, across much of their service provision, but in particular, a few years ago, they purchased the RSL in St. George. It had already closed down, but they didn't buy it and shut it down. It was already closed down. And they've um, embarked on a process of um, renovate, renovating and repurposing the site to become a community wellbeing centre. St. George is a small um, town, it's kind of classified kind of remote almost, it's about 3,000 people with a very high Indigenous population. And they're renovating it to include um, meeting rooms, food storage, as you can see there, fitness and outdoor things. But there'll be a range of programs. Anywhere between 30 to 50 activities will come out of the centre when it's fully operational, including health education, physical activity, school support, uh, like their Big Buddy program is already providing um, after school programs and other programs. Um, social emotional well-being um, services around cultural connections and cultural programs. There's already uh, emergency food relief uh, in there and other things will, will grow around health and beauty and food and drink. So it's a really exciting um, development and expected to open in October or November this year. So what's its aim? It's going to contribute to closing the gap targets, um, all of them but particularly focusing on a select few that it can directly influence, but it'll have a broader influence across um, intergenerational change at a population wide level around social and emotional wellbeing. It'll provide health and mainstream educational opportunities. Now Gundy does have a primary care clinic and dental service in St. George. So that will stay there, the primary care, but this won't be uh, providing the, the primary care uh, from the clinical doctor point of view and it'll deliver preventative health services that are that, uh, focused on holistic wellbeing. The agenda has been determined by the community, Aboriginal and community, and it's driven by the community. Our role as the uh, um, kind of leading the research and evaluation has been, isn't, isn't to direct at this stage to direct services and activities come out of there. It's to establish an evaluation and research plan to support delivery. So this, these are the members of our research oversight committee that's been established. I chair that group. And as you can see, there's a diversity of members. Um, and number one priority is developing that research and evaluation plan. Now, this piece of work we're doing now, it's very, uh, it's funded by Gundia, CSIRO and Southern Queensland Rural Health. They pulled a small amount of funds, so we're resourced to develop this, this plan. Now it's going to have two main arms, um, the evaluation. So obviously looking at process impact initially and, um, you know, feeding into that continuous quality improvement and, um, and uh, you know, so that the services then can evolve and as a research and evaluation um, team or, or um, a governance and oversight, we can then feed into service delivery and activity to strengthen, strengthen those based on evidence, which is what we've been discussing today. Um, so routine data collection will go, come through. So, so the other part, obviously, sorry, is the longitudinal study, which we're uh, putting together and it'll, we're hoping to, to uh, attract um, community for five to 10, maybe 20 years. And we'll do that through routine data collection, uh, service delivery and activities of the centre and Gundia Health Service and annual wellbeing surveys. Um, and as I say, the, the wellbeing interventions, they're determined and developed by the community. Um, and we're currently in the co-design phase. So findings of the evaluation inform the ongoing delivery and development of interventions. And um, we're kind of at the stage where we're um, about to sort of finalize the evaluation. So in summary, 
uh, and to, to close, um, and I'm, you know, maybe there'll be some questions uh, for me, but just if you're approaching uh, research um, and implementation science with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, think about are you working with or for the community? And I've just given you two examples there where one is we're working with the community and that's with the M Health intervention uh, around hypertension. And the other one around St George Wellbeing Centre, we're actually working for the community in that regard. Um, there can be other models, but, but just something to always be mindful of when you're working with the community. And also what is Indigenous leadership and decision-making and research? Now, I don't have the answer for that, but I think it's something that we always need to be mindful of and re reflective of and sort of understand that, um, you know, it's important that our people are the decision makers in what's going on and how you structure that in your um, research project. Um, you know, always be mindful of the power imbalance. Um, and like I know in my case, uh, I, I represent Flinders and Syro, two big institutions. So I'm kind of like kidding myself, I think, in, in my capacity as a professor and a chief investigator, that I'm speaking for representing these communities. Um, but I work with the community so that those decisions can be made um, with those communities. And just a reminder, when we're working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community control organisations, that research isn't their day-to-day -day business. Um, so we need to sort of have uh, reasonable expectations around their role and participation in research. So um, just some, some tips there about um, um, our challenge, of course, is where does co-design fit in? It's fundamental. And just sort of reiterating some of the points earlier around um, it, it's, it's uh, you know, th there isn't a script all, always for implementation science. So you need to be flexible with the starting point. Um, invest time and resources in building and maintaining relationships. Um, and really kind of be focusing on understanding what does and doesn't work. Um, you know, things, being able to pick up on what doesn't work early on and strengthening things that do work. And really important is um, uh, lived experience of our people is critical in implementation science. I mean, we come at it uh, as an approach We'll approach implementation science as uh, experts through research and education and science as experts in that field. Um, but it's the people who have the real understanding on the ground are in implementation science. So um, we uh, so these these principles. Um, I just wanted to uh, reiterate that. Um, We've developed within the team a uh, model around relationships for partnerships, um, around co-design with the Indigenous community and health and uh, health service that emphasises the significance and importance of relationships with our community before commencing research. Um, and just to quote Andrew, um, it's imperative that the research community involved involve Indigenous people at the first hour. Rather than, 11th, rather than the 11th hour when developing research studies. So thank you. Thanks so much, Ray. Those were really excellent case studies. Now let's give our audience a chance to ask questions to our amazing speakers. So please pop your questions into the Q&A box. And while the audience is doing that, if I could please have my last slide up. There you go. In case anyone has to duck off before the end of the q and I'd just like to remind everyone that we'll have an anonymous survey for you to complete upon exit. Uh, it, this helps us to know what worked well and what we can improve for the next time. And again, our email address is there on the slide in case you would need to reach out to us. All right, we already have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. 
Yep. So the first question is from an anonymous attendee. So I think this was when Jill was talking about the many frameworks and theories we have on implementation. Um, how many frameworks and theories are applicable to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander healthcare needs, specifically diabetes needs? Uh, I think uh, with a follow up question, because if these theories and frameworks are designed by largely European researchers, how do we know fundamentals to theories and frameworks are translational to other cultures? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'll take the first the first question first. So um, I think there are very few theories and frameworks that are um, developed for a specific issue or a specific population group they tend to be generic so for example not for the topic of diabetes but as I say there are literally tens probably over a hundred of them um, and um, there's Ray will know this better than me but I think there's relatively little being done around implementation frameworks specifically for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, but, you know, the Witcher Institute have done a review of the, uh, I think they've done a review of the frameworks um, and developed a, a planning toolkit. And, and it does come down to those same issues around, you know, you've got to think about how people view um the the project or um or the change that's proposed are they able do they are they able motivated capable do they have the support to implement it um so um my sense would be um that there probably is a gap but i think you know if just pull in uh, on what ray presented in terms of co-design and work doing implementation research not on people but with people those are really fundamental principles um and certainly in Canada um there's there definitely has been um, a fair bit of work on translation and implementation with indigenous peoples so some of the frameworks that have come out of Canada have drawn on that as well so yeah as far as I know there isn't specifically one but I think the core things to think about um are are potentially sort of transferable excellent Ray do you have anything to add to Yeah, thanks. Look, um, yeah, thanks. I, I think if you're embarking in this direction, um, looking in the literature at published uh, results or published uh, development of in Indigenous diabetes programs and other um, in initiatives, will we'll pro provide an insight into how other research groups have tackled those questions. Um, yeah. I think the one thing I'd say, um, is you can't do implementation, science or implementation research in a traditional conventional academic way. It is, it is an engaged process because ultimately it's about improving care or, or improving health systems. So um, it's got to be done as a, in, a, in an engaged way using the types of methods that Ray's talked about because that's the strongest way to, to promote uptake of, of uh, or implementation. Excellent. Uh, we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, uh, they said, I would argue that research is their thing. It's just that the definition of research is different. Maybe we first we need to first and foremost ask Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to define their perspective of what research actually is. is that, that's a good comment. I'm not sure if that's a question, but I, you yeah. know, I definitely agree. Yeah, I think it builds on uh, what Ray said about uh, for, uh, First Nations peoples being the first scientists and. Uh, yeah, I, I agree as well. <laughs> so Rini Fiolet has another question. Ray, how do we find out more about those guidelines your team have come up with? 
That's that's an excellent uh, question. Um, Andrew and I are working very closely together to refining relationships before relationships before partnerships. And as I mentioned, and I'll mention it again, Andrew's about to submit his, his uh, PhD thesis. And um, once that's submitted, then we'll work on um, publishing um, a publication to, to provide context around those, but we're starting to communicate um, the, in, in more depth and detail uh, when we get opportunities at conferences and, uh, and those things. So look, it's a great question. And, and look, we found it, um, from our perspective, it kind of helps fill a gap because, uh, and, and you know, we've been talking around guidelines and frameworks and instructions, and there's plenty out there, which is great. And in particular, when we're undertaking research with our people, there's the AATSIS guidelines and there's the NHMRC Indigenous guidelines. And I know that it was a, um, a focus of the previous webinar, um, but, but sometimes some of us can do with some help up front on how to you know, get the ball rolling and undertaking research. And um, you know, one of my uh, questions at the end there was where does, um, you know, where does co-design fit in when we talk about ethics and, and implementation in science? And um, you know, building a strong relationship, commencing the co-design process, uh, I would argue has to happen before you get ethics. Anyway, look, I'll stop and hand back another story. Yeah. So an, another question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they're asking for advice on developing collaborative working groups for co-design with varied language groups, particularly on land that other language groups have been forced onto due to colonization. Thanks. Yeah, well, it, it starts with building a, building a relationship with yeah. the particular communities you uh, would like to work with. And there's a number of ways you can start building that relationship. Um, but respect is the, the first step in building that relationship. Um, you know, looking at what um, your network of colleagues or friends might have as far as um, into people who are already involved with that community and building a sort of a relationship and trust through that way. You know, having the time to invest in, you know, community events and, you know, visiting at times when um, people who aren't from that community are allowed to visit. Uh, look, ultimately it can take time and, uh, it, you know, depend on the project and the individual uh, and many factors. Yeah, that, that's a good point about um, yeah, the relationship building really takes time. That's all, uh, often a point that comes up in our uh, in our webinars so far is that um, the researchers are often struggling to make that first connection, that first step. And it's um, it's good that we have you to give us some advice on how to do that. Um, yep. So, and, and I think, Judy, I, I'd yep. add to that really being prepared to listen and understand the problem. Absolutely. Um, because there is a tendency, I think, um, from a research perspective, to think to think you've got a solution, but that solution might not actually match the need. Um, so, you know, that that initial time is so important to really listen and make sure that the research is, is answering the questions that are the most important. And if I can just add that um, being able to listen and understand what the community's questions are as, is, is important. Yeah. And as, as a researcher and a scientist, our expertise, um, we, we can turn our expertise to help the community solve a whole range of different problems, even if we might individually have a particular area of focus or expertise it's those research skills uh, and it's about supporting what the community or the whether it's a aboriginal community or non-aboriginal community need as far as research all right we have another question if we want to implement healthcare system changes from an implementation science perspective where do you start talking with the change makers of the health system getting the buy-in first? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, 
I, I actually think that you you often are working at multiple levels. Um, so, um, you know, it's like the bottom up and the top down. You, you definitely need the, the support and the sponsorship, but you need to build the engagement from, from the ground upwards. So it clearly depends on the nature of, of the questions that you're answering and um, and where they sit in terms of the health system. But often, and that, that's why I think context really matters, is because context runs from where you're trying to do a particular piece of work right through to the, the bigger system that's embedded in. And sometimes the barriers and the enablers are, are at that system level. So in, in, in our projects, you know, there would be the sort of very local uh, engagement co-design work, but we would encourage and be looking for more senior level sponsorship um, to support what, what the project's about. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's many factors and uh, having um, senior level endorsement and support is, is critical. Um, sometimes having um, on-site local champions but also can be uh, really instructive of um, success. Um, but uh, definitely, yeah, being aware of the different um, people that need to be you know, involved is, is critical to help you sort of develop the strategy within your implementation of the science around how to uh, work with each of those different. And, you know, the conversations, you, as you know, the conversations you have with a senior leader in a health service or a hospital will be different to the conversations of the clinicians um, and patients or clients. Yeah, um, another question. Has implementation science been successful in influencing what ACHOs do with their funding rather than answer to funders, KPIs or reportables? A feeling that's a loaded question from Mr. or not Mr. or Mrs. <laughs> um, how long can we go for? Do you reckon? <laughs> oh, oh, we have a few minutes. <laughs> look, uh, I guess my opinion is that there's a, a lot of uh, research and interventions and um, change and and, pro and a lot of things going on in the HO sector or HO sector that. Uh, you could reverse engineer and call it implementation science already. So um, oh, okay. yeah, it is. But just to reiterate that um, with, the, with the project we're doing with St. George and the Wellbeing Centre, it's very much been driven uh, by the CEO, uh, Floyd Leedy, excellent uh, leader, that, uh, you know, he, you know, he's um, responding to and answerable to the closed and gap targets as a certain, as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Community Control Service that's there for the community and representing the community. So it's a challenge to um, tick off both, but good question. All right, I think that is all our, of our questions and we're just on time. Uh, thanks so much, Ray and Jill for joining us today. It was a really productive uh, session and um, thanks for everyone who's joined us in the seminar so far. Just to remind you that there will be a post event survey just to help guide our series further. And uh, that's it. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great afternoon.